What if I told you that the gold in your jewelry, or even in your phone, might have come from a mountain exploded by 500 tons of explosives? Forget what you think you know about gold mining. This isn't the Wild West anymore. Today, gold extraction is a hyper-engineered billion-dollar operation involving satellite imaging, 3D geological models, and tons of rock just to find a speck of gold you can't even see. But here's the twist. Even with all that, not all that glitters is gold. So how is it really done? Gold mining today has come a long, long way since the gold rush days of pickaxes and pans. Back then, all you needed was a river, some patience, and a little luck. If you struck the right spot, a single pan of water could reveal chunky nuggets shimmering in the sun. But those days are long gone. Today, the odds are wildly different. Most modern gold deposits don't sparkle. They're invisible. Microscopic particles hidden inside tons of regular looking rock. To get enough gold for a single ring, miners might have to move literal truckloads of earth. So how do you even begin to find gold like that? Well, it starts long before a single shovel hits the ground. Before you can mine gold, you have to find it. But what if it's hiding where you can't even see it? Gold, in its natural state, rarely reveals itself. It doesn't sit on the ground glinting in the sun, begging to be picked up. In fact, most of the gold we mine today is so deeply embedded, so microscopic, that even a trained geologist might walk right past it without ever noticing. And yet, humans have found a way to track it down. It all starts with exploration, a phase that's equal parts science, tech, and educated guesswork. Picture a team of geologists standing in the middle of a vast, empty plain. No visible clues, no signs, just miles of barren terrain. Their job? To figure out if there's gold hidden hundreds of feet beneath their boots. How? They begin by decoding the Earth itself. Geoscientists use topographic maps, rock samples, and remote sensing tools to look for ancient geological patterns, fault lines, hydrothermal vents, mineral veins, that might hint at buried treasure. Sometimes, satellites are used to scan from space, analyzing reflected light to detect subtle mineral signatures invisible to the human eye. Next comes geophysics. This is where it gets even more sci-fi. Special instruments measure gravity and magnetic fields underground, helping experts map variations in rock density. They can detect strange anomalies, subtle shifts in magnetic pull that suggest something unusual, something potentially profitable. Still, none of this guarantees success. To narrow the search, geochemists analyze soil and water samples for tiny traces of gold, or other pathfinder elements like arsenic or antimony. If these trace elements are present, they act like whispers from deep below, clues pointing to a possible deposit. It's a slow, meticulous process. Some sites take years to explore, many turn up empty. But once enough data is collected and patterns begin to emerge, a decision is made. It's time to drill. Enormous rigs are brought in, towering machines that bore deep into the earth pulling out core samples, long cylindrical rods of ancient rock. These samples are the true test. Inside them may be the faint glimmer of gold, often invisible to the naked eye, but confirmed by lab analysis. If the results are promising, the data is compiled into something revolutionary, a 3D geologic model. This isn't just a diagram, it's a digital twin of the underground world, showing exactly where concentrations of gold lie, how deep they go, and how they might be reached it's like opening a locked treasure chest with X-ray vision. But this model does more than guide the dig. It determines if a mine is even worth building. Because mining isn't cheap, it's a massive investment. And if that underground map doesn't show enough gold, enough grade and volume, then the entire project might be scrapped before it even begins. And if the numbers do add up, that's when the explosions begin. Finding the gold is only the beginning. Now, you have to tear through the earth to get to it. Once the 3D model is built and the deposit is confirmed, the next phase begins. And it's one of the most dramatic steps in modern mining. Blasting. But this isn't chaos. It's not some wild explosion in the middle of the desert. It's a surgical strike, controlled, timed to the millisecond, and planned with absolute precision. Think of it like heart surgery. Except instead of arteries, you're dealing with layers of rock the size of skyscrapers. First, the drill and blast crew arrives on site. These are specialists trained to reshape entire mountains, one detonation at a time. Armed with enormous drill rigs, they get to work punching hundreds of holes into the surface. Each hole is meticulously placed in a pattern designed by mining engineers using that 3D geological model. Some holes go 30, 40, even 60 feet deep. Why so many? Because gold isn't found in a single, clean line. It's scattered in uneven veins, sometimes thin as a hair, sometimes embedded in rock that looks worthless to the untrained eye. Once the pattern is drilled, the crew loads each hole with a special blasting compound, typically ANFO, 
a mix of ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel. It might sound basic, but this mixture has been the backbone of industrial blasting for decades. It's stable, powerful, and predictable. Next comes the choreography. The blast foreman does a final sweep. Roads are closed. Workers are evacuated from the zone. A loudspeaker blares the countdown. Fire in the hole! Then, silence, followed by a deep, earth-rumbling roar. In less than five seconds, the carefully engineered explosion fractures thousands of tons of rock. Dust shoots into the sky. A wall of debris collapses. What was once solid mountain is now a heap of shattered earth, ready to be moved. But here's where things get even more fascinating. Not all that broken rock is gold-bearing. That's why geologists are on standby, analyzing the blast zone immediately after detonation. They inspect the rubble, compare it to the model, and mark which areas contain high-grade ore, and which are just waste. Then the machines move in. Colossal hydraulic shovels and front-end loaders, some as big as a two-story house, start scooping up the debris. Their job is to load it into haul trucks, each capable of carrying up to 240 tons. That's nearly half a million pounds per trip. To put it in perspective, one of these trucks weighs more than 200 average-sized cars. And where does it all go? High-grade ore is taken straight to the processing plant. Low-grade material might be stockpiled for later. And the rest? Sent to the waste rock facility, a carefully engineered zone designed to protect the surrounding environment. But here's the question. How do you turn all that broken rock into actual gleaming gold? It doesn't happen with fire or a hammer. It starts with a liquid. You've blasted through a mountain, hauled out tons of rock, but there's still no gold in sight. So where is it? At this point, you've got mountains of shattered ore sitting at the edge of the mine, rock that geologists swear contains gold. And yet, to the naked eye, there's nothing. No shimmer, no sparkle, just dust and rubble. So how do you get the gold out? The answer lies in chemistry. A very specific, very powerful kind. First, the ore is crushed into fine particles. Giant mills, each one the size of a small building, grind the rock down until it's no thicker than sand. Why? Because the gold is often trapped inside individual mineral grains, and breaking it apart is the only way to free it. Next, this powdery mixture is mixed with water to create a slurry, a thick, muddy solution that looks like dirty soup. And this is where the magic begins. The slurry is pumped into a series of massive tanks where a weak solution of cyanide is added. Yes, cyanide. The same chemical that's infamous for its toxicity is strangely enough, the gold industry's secret weapon. In small controlled doses, it has an extraordinary ability. It can dissolve gold. Inside those tanks, the cyanide solution begins to bond with the microscopic gold particles, pulling them out of the rock and into the liquid. It's like coaxing gold out of hiding, but we're still not done. To collect the dissolved gold, activated carbon, a type of specially treated charcoal, is added to the mix. The gold particles prefer the carbon over the liquid, so they attach themselves to it. It's a slow, almost invisible process, but over time, the carbon becomes loaded with precious metal. Now it's time to get the gold off the carbon. This is done through an intense chemical process, where the carbon is stripped and the gold is turned back into liquid form, this time in a purified solution. That solution is then sent through something called an electro-winning circuit. It sounds complex, but the idea is simple. Using electricity to pull pure gold out of the solution, atom by atom. Imagine a metal rack submerged in liquid gold, and as the current flows through it, tiny flakes of gold begin to appear, slowly, steadily, like reverse rain. These flakes are collected, dried, and finally, melted. Inside a furnace heated to over 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, the gold is turned into a bubbling, molten pool. Then, in one of the most mesmerizing sights in modern industry, the liquid gold is poured into molds. Bars are formed, solid, heavy, gleaming. But even now, they're not pure. These bars, known as doré bars, are about 85% gold and 15% silver and other metals. They'll be shipped off, usually to a refinery in Europe, where they'll be purified into investment-grade bullion. But before we close the loop, there's one final chapter left. What happens to the land after the gold is gone? So the gold is gone, the trucks are silent, the blast sirens no longer echo through the valley. What now? A modern gold mine isn't just a hole in the ground. It's a living, breathing operation, a city of machines, data, chemistry, and people. But like all things, it eventually reaches its end. The veins run dry, the ore is exhausted, and the question becomes, what do you do with a mountain that's been blown apart? This is where most people switch off, but here's the twist. What happens after the mining might be the most important part of all. It's called reclamation, the process of healing the land. 
and it starts while mining is still going on. Modern mines don't wait until the end to fix what they've disrupted. Instead, they reclaim as they go. Areas that have been mined out are reshaped, covered, and replanted, while extraction continues in nearby sections. The goal? To make the transition seamless. To ensure that once the last truck drives away, nature is already on its way back. But let's be honest, restoring a scarred landscape isn't easy. The ground must be reshaped to prevent erosion. Drainage systems are rebuilt to stop contaminants from leaching into nearby rivers. Topsoil, which was removed and stored during the early days of the project, is now returned to the surface. It's spread out carefully, like frosting on a cake, preparing the land for one final act. Growth. Native grasses, trees, and shrubs are planted. Seeds are chosen not just for how they look, but for how deep their roots grow, how well they hold the soil together, and how they support local wildlife. In some cases, entire wetlands are reconstructed. Habitats that vanished decades ago are given a second chance. And slowly, the transformation begins. But reclamation isn't just about planting trees. It's about long-term responsibility. For years, sometimes decades, mining companies are required to monitor the land. They test the water, track plant growth, measure soil quality. If something isn't working, they fix it. Why go to all this trouble? Because modern mining is no longer just about extraction. It's about legacy. Every mine leaves a footprint. The challenge is making sure that footprint fades. And sometimes the results are extraordinary. Former mine sites have been turned into parks, farms, even nature reserves. In Montana, one old gold mine is now a sanctuary for migrating birds. In Australia, a reclaimed site was transformed into a vineyard. And in Canada, a former mining zone now hosts solar panels that power the nearby town. What was once seen as destruction becomes rebirth. So the next time you hold a gold ring, or glance at the tiny traces of gold inside your smartphone, remember that metal had a story. It was buried for millions of years, discovered by science, blasted from the earth, purified by fire. And the land that gave it up is being given back. But here's the real question. What happens when the gold runs out? Everywhere. We mined it, we melted it, we gave the land back, but at what cost? Gold is more than just a shiny metal. It's currency, power, technology, and beauty, woven into the fabric of everything from global finance to wedding bands. But behind every ounce of it lies a journey few people ever see. Exploration teams searching for invisible signals underground. Mountains drilled and detonated with surgical precision. Massive trucks hauling invisible wealth one load at a time. And the silent chemistry that transforms rock into treasure. All for something that fits in the palm of your hand. So the next time you see gold, whether in a necklace, a coin, or a phone, remember that it wasn't just mined. It was earned through science, through risk, through fire. But there's one question we didn't answer. What happens when the gold is gone? Because here's the truth, we're extracting more than ever before. The richest, most accessible deposits are already behind us. And the search for gold is pushing us deeper, further into places no one imagined mining before. Jungles, oceans, even the seafloor. What are we willing to trade for a metal we can't eat, can't drink, and yet can't seem to live without? If you found this video fascinating, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon, and leave a comment. Should the world move on from gold? Or will we chase it until there's nothing left to chase? Stay curious, stay grounded, and remember, everything that shines came from deep below.